I think I think we're on. Thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, sticking it out till the last session here, last of the Drupal camp. Everybody have a good Drupal camp? Is it good? All right, I had a great time. I love this campus. I've of all the UC campuses, maybe not the first, but I love this campus. I'll come here anytime. Um, so hi, my name is Sean DeArmond. Uh, I work for UC Davis. Uh, I run the web development team uh, in IET, uh, Information Educational Technology. That's what we call our central IT unit. Um, my invisible uh, colleague here is Mark Miller, who we've given this presentation a couple times together, but he unfortunately couldn't make it. So you get to watch me fumble through his part um, later on. We're going to talk about uh, continuous integration, uh, automated testing. We're going to spend a lot of time on automated testing. Um, I tried to learn how to do the DevOps thing a few years ago, and uh, this is the presentation I wish I had two years ago. So that's why I put it together, why we put it together, because if you're getting started and you just want to figure out what to do, hopefully, hopefully this will help. Um, so this is literally a slide from a presentation I made in 2012 in, at Bad Camp, Bay Area Drupal Camp, and I was talking about a Git workflow um, about you want to have your dev test in live, and then you have your code base move from dev to test to live, and then you have your data, your, your SQL database and, and your files, it moves back in the other direction, right? So this was kind of the, a standard development workflow. It, it also ended up being I mean, not because of me, but it, if you use any of the tools like Aqua or Pantheon or, or, um, or Platform, they all do this sort of thing where they give you a dev test in live and that helps you with tools to move back and forth. And we'll get into some of those. And this isn't necessarily wrong, but I think the complexities of modern web development means we need to update this a little bit. Um, there's a lot more kind of pieces. There's a lot more other um, uh, environments that you can set up. Um, and uh, kind of gets at the center of it still. So I want to try to introduce this um, model now for a development and release workflow. So instead of just dev test and live, um, I've, I've sort of spread it out this way, where you have your local development. Because really, you don't dev on dev, like on a server on Pantheon. So you, you don't dev there. Usually, you dev on your local. So we have our local environment. Um, Git sort of at the center of all this, but that might be your Git repo in Bitbucket or GitHub or something, GitLab or something like that. Then you have testing, or like for code review, um, and that's not even necessarily one particular place because it might be that Docker is spinning up containers at one or more places and then get just gets destroyed. So it's not like a server that lives somewhere necessarily, um, though, though it could be. Um, and then what we used to call tests, I like calling staging because by the time it gets to like your test environment right before you go deploy, you've probably already done all your automated testing and you've, you've done all the internal testing. So staging is more like you know, user acceptance testing where it's, you're, you're simulating your rollout before you deploy to production, just making sure one last time that everything, when everything comes together with your newest update from, uh, from, your, from your live environment. Um, and then there's deployment, like your, that's, so that's, that's your live environment there. So let's, let's add some arrows here. So this might be how your code flows. They might go directly through. I, I don't see that normally. I usually see something more like this, where it really Git's pushing this out, or, or maybe a pull. Um, anyway, the, the code is flowing from Git into these environments individually. And then, of course, from local, it still goes straight into Git. So however, however your model works, um, that's where you'll see the, the, your code flow. And then you'll have your data, that's your database and your files. They'll flow in the other direction, but usually it's not in that order. You're not going directly backwards. You're going, ideally, taking stuff from your, uh, your deployment and bringing it back to all the other environments. So um, does that, that sort of make sense there? Um, and uh, this is still open for interpretation, however your, your workflow ends up. But anywhere you see a green arrow around here, those are green. Yeah, anywhere you see a green arrow, that's where it would be really nice if you didn't have to do that manually, right? 
So this is when we start talking about continuous integration, right? So how do we, how do we have when things happen, I don't have to think about the next thing that, that needs to happen, it'll just go off and do it, and it'll do things automated in a way that's repeatable, it's gonna do it every time, and something that might take a really, really, really long time might just take a few seconds if you let the robots do it. So that's why we're talking here, we're gonna have robots do work for us because they're really good at it, um, and uh, we can utilize their speed to, um, and, and consistency to do these, these things, all right? So how are we going to do it? How are we going to get the robots to do our stuff? Well, really, we're just going to script it. Um, that's a kind of a bailout answer, but uh, that's really what we're, what we're going to end up doing here. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to look at each one of these sort of in turn, and let's talk about each of those environments, and let's talk about the kind of things that we can do um, for, for those arrows in each of those environments and the sort of tools that are available for us to do this. Um, so local development, uh, we, use, uh, we used to use MAMP on our local environment. I'm sure people still do, but we're moving away from that to these other tools that are available now. Um, these are all based on Docker, and I love these local development tools now. Like, this has really made things a lot easier to be able to use local development environments such as Doxel or Lando. And they're, they're all pretty kind of the same. They, they do a lot of the same stuff. Some are faster than others and whatever. We use Doxel, but really it, it, any of these, depending on what you're doing, um, really help to be able to spin up customized Docker environments um, on your local machine that you don't mind destroying um, because you can just spin them up again. The other nice thing about how this works is um, it actually stores your configuration for those local development environments in your project itself. So like there's a, if for Doxel, there's a folder in your project in the Git repo, dot Doxel, and in there is where all the configuration is for what sort of Docker environments, what version of PHP, what version of MySQL. Um, and so it, that means that each of your developers, if you're working in a team, you don't have to say, well, it worked on my machine. Why didn't it work on your machine? Well, what version of PHP do you have? Well, I think I have this version. Let me go and dig through MAP to find out. And how do I change the version of PHP? Oh, you downloaded MAP 4, 4 or 5 instead of mine's 3. And anyway, you just don't have to worry about that because all that configuration is in the project itself. And that helps you really map to production, too. So if you know your production is running PHP 7.2 with MySQL, five dot something and you know your test environment, uh, you can set up your test environment to do the same thing. We'll talk about that in a second. You set up your local to be the same thing. So, and then one project might be, have those parameters or those versions of software. Another project might have something totally different. So it's really easy to be able to confine or store that in the code. Um, and uh, you can tell when it's changed. Anyway, so I love being able to store that configuration in code. The other thing you can do is that there's, these all allow a certain level of scripting. You can make your own scripts and store them in your code to do the sorts of things that you need to do. So, something like initialize the environment. So Doxel has a command fin in it, in it, I-N-I-T, in it. What that does is you can customize it, but basically it just spins up a default uh, Docker cluster for you. But if you wanted to also check out this repository, run composer install, do this, do that, do whatever, what we can do now is, assuming we have Doxel installed correctly, so there's a step getting the local development tools installed. Someone runs fin in it on a project, they have the whole environment set up just by running the script. It might take a few minutes to run, right? So that might go and check out all the right stuff. It might, you know, uh, download the database and it might uh, you know install the database or it might install a brand new database or whatever it's going to do so um, we have another uh, script which is refresh data from live so what that does is that goes to your live site grabs the most recent uh, database backup um, and files backup from live downloads it and sticks it right into the um, right into your local site or local local development environment so now you're like, okay, now I want to make sure that this all works based on you know, the stuff that we have on live. A quick command, takes a minute to run, goes and grabs it, and now you're ready to go again. You don't have to log into your, uh, your hosting environment, click backup, grab the file, download the file, unpack the file. Oh, it's still named live 
dash files instead of just file. So you don't have to worry about any of that. It just always does it and does it every time. Um, you can run automated tests locally. Um, so that's another script that we have to have it run, the BHAT tests. Um, also with the local development, you want to use a good IDE. Um, so some of those tools actually come with their own IDE, which is sort of cool. We use uh, PHP Storm, which there was a great presentation yesterday. If you missed it, uh, watch the recording on using PHP Storm, because there's a lot of automation stuff that he shows in that to be able to really make you an effective, uh, fast developer. Um, and then doing step through debugging uh, with, that, with that IDE it's, as well. So let's look at Git. Um, so when I'm talking about Git, really what you want to use is a, a hosted Git service, you know, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or whatever. There's a lot of tools um, using that service that can automate a lot of this stuff to happen, right? So there's all these different um, uh, hosting services. Use one of them. It doesn't really matter which. Um, so with Git, um, I think it's a really important thing um, particularly if you're working in a team, to really have an established branching strategy. So this is an image of Git flow, uh, the original diagram of Git flow that someone put together, I don't know, 10 years ago or however long that was. And um, it's fine, that's, that's good, it's well known. Um, it's pretty complex, it's meant for larger projects because there's a lot of branching going on. If you're on a much smaller project, you can slim that down some. That's basically what we use. We change it slightly, but um, find, find a, a, a branching strategy that works for you and your team and then use it on every project because if you have somebody else that tries to join a project and you're using some rando uh, get branching strategy or none at all, now you have to try to introduce it just get used to using it on every project, even if you're the only developer, because you never know when another one's going to come, and then you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to get them involved, and then you have to teach them what the strategy is. No, figure one out for the team, and this is just the thing you're going to use. Um, and then some, uh, some uh, security things too, like always use SSH keys. Don't use. Um, those don't use username and passwords for for your Git environment. There was a security issue. Um, uh, a few months ago, uh, that was a big, a big deal. And then use multi-factor authentication too. So that's, that's just good sense. Um, pull requests uh, happen within the, that Git tool itself. That's a great time to do a code review. Um, so you do approvals, the comment threads, it's all put together into one place. Um, so here's the approvals. You can see if, the, if you can see the little tiny green, the check mark, that means I have invited those people to this pull request. And uh, then you click the little app approve button and then I can say, yes, yeah, somebody else has actually looked at this. Um, and it means also that uh, you can set up some uh, requirements for your project too if you really want to get, uh, get official about it where you're not allowed to merge unless somebody has approved. So you, if you have an enterprise institution or something where they uh, require that sort of thing because um, you always want to have code review, but code review is always a good idea anyway. So. Um, you could do, uh, the, like I said, the comment thread. So how do I test this? I'm getting this result. You know, you might want to think about this. Um, you can also leave comments in the line of the code itself. So, or in a, you'll see the, I'm, I'm not going to show it here, but in the, you'll see the diff um, on, the, on the GitHub or the Bitbucket repository. And you'll, you, can, you can leave a comment on a line of the diff, say, why did you do this right here? You know, this might be a better function to use. Did you know the function you're using here is deprecated? So it's nice to be able to do that right within the pull request. And then, of course, automated testing, right? So usually, all these tools have integrations with automated testing tools, right? And so this is Bitbucket. You can see up in the upper right there, well, what is it? Eight of eight has passed, right? So that means we have eight uh, script steps or, or tests that we have run um, against this code base. And it's going to tell me right here that, that all of them have passed. And then you can click on it, and you can go into those tools to see exactly what they did. If they failed, why they fail, something something didn't work out. So that's really where you want to be able to see everything all in one place. And it makes reviewing this very, very, very nice uh, and easy and fast. Because um, we we're, we're all trying to speed up. That's what we're trying to do here. So the testing is key. And so I'm going to end up spending a lot of time on testing. We'll probably spend uh, 
I don't know, at least a third of this whole presentation, we're going to go over a lot of these testing. Because I think um, this is a place where you can speed up your process considerably and be able to uh, have a more reliable code. You can push updates uh, faster. Security patches can be pushed faster um, because you can be more sure that you know, this change that we're making isn't going to break everything else. So either, if, you, if you're not doing automated testing, either you're spending hours and hours clicking through the interface to check everything manually, which you're probably not, um, or things are going to slip through, and you're going to spend hours and hours debugging the problem when it's actually in production. That's worse, by the way. Um, but that's the, the reality we've dealt with in a long time, for a long time before these automated testing tools really became available to us and really easy to use. So let's look at, um, let's look at these testing. So continuous integration um, with these tools. So this is uh, CircleCI. Um, the, this is one way to do it. That's a good tool. Um, Pantheon has an integration with CircleCI if you uh, want to use CircleCI for running the tests, for doing the builds, um, for all that stuff. So this is, uh, this is one option here. Um, this is ProboCI. I like ProboCI a lot um, for automated testing. Um, and uh, so it, it works pretty much the same way, except there's one important difference, and that's this. Probo CI will actually keep an environment alive for you for some amount of time um, after the build is done, which means now you have a functional site, Drupal site or whatever, that you, with a real URL that you can email or, or Slack or whatever to your teammates or to stakeholders or to you know, your boss and say, hey, that feature that we were just talking about, what do you think about this? because this is how we envision this to work. And this is, they don't have to have a local development environment. They don't have to check out the code or run composer install or any of that crap. That they, they wouldn't want to do that and you wouldn't want to teach them. But you can send them a URL and say, hey, log in with this admin username and password or you, know, you might have an editor password or whatever. Log in here, check this out, and now you can see whether that feature that you asked for is that what you had in mind or does this solve your particular goal. So being able to have this environment that's kept alive is super cool. Um, and the way Probo works is it, it, it keeps it alive and you, your plan that you purchase is like for some amount of space. So more, more environments get added and the old ones just start going away. And if you ever want to bring one back again, like a pull request that's been sitting around for a week, you just hit rebuild and it'll come back again. So I, I really like using this tool. Um, yeah, so that's what it does. So this, this is after the build, we have our testing site um, here on Probo. And so Probo works off of pull requests, so you do this on the pull request, so you'll be able to see that all those things have run. Um, most of these CI tools work more or less the same way. You write a YAML file that's a configuration file. And uh, don't, you don't have to read this, it doesn't matter, but um, this is, which one is this? Probo. Um, and so, uh, basically, it's just all these steps, and where you see a lot of lines, green lines in a row, those are just like uh, bash lines. So you're basically writing a bash script. Um, but the CA tools do have different, uh, I don't want plugins or or different functions that you can run. So Probo, for instance, has a has a Drupal plugin, um, and so. The complexities of setting up a Drupal site programmatically with Bash, you kind of don't have to worry about. You just say, yeah, set up Drupal. Here's the database. Our doc root is you know, web or doc root or whatever. Go. And it'll, it'll just, it just knows it's Drupal because the Probo is built by a Drupal company, Zivtech. And so they know that it's Drupal, and it'll build your Drupal site for you. So you tell it's Drupal 8, it'll build a Drupal 8 site for you. And at the very top, you probably can't see that, but you, you declare what um, Docker container you want to use, and Probo gives you a list of a bunch of them, or you could build your own if you want it. And so you can decide, okay, this is going to be PHP 7.2, it's going to be this particular Docker container, that sort of stuff. So you want to make, you know, that's where you would match what is in your local development environment and to your, uh, to your production. So automated testing. So what these things do, um, they, do they can do other things too. Uh, CircleCI does all kinds of stuff. Bitbucket Pipelines is another. But let's focus on automated testing. I really think that this is where, like I said, this is where you can really save a lot of your time and really make for good code base. Um, I'm going to break this up into four different types of, of testing. 
that you can do. Um, unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing, and visual regression. End-to-end um, -end and integration are similar. Um, I'm, I'm going to separate them but because uh, they're a little different, but they're very similar. So let's look at each one of these in turn. I'm going to give you a case study on, um, on how we've used uh, each of these. So unit tests. Um, unit tests are great um, because uh, they are extremely fast to run. But that's because they only test one little teeny tiny thing. So if you have a function or you have an, uh, a, a, a class that you're creating in Drupal or something, you can test that it does this one thing. So an example might be, um, I have a function and it adds two numbers together. So I need to test that function to say, I'm going to give it two parameters, um, a three and a three, and you better give me back a six. I don't care how you do it. You can, you know, you can use whatever code you want in there. You can call your friend. You can whatever, right? However you're going to get it, I want that number six back. So that's what the unit test says. Doesn't care what it's a part of. Doesn't care that it's part of a Drupal site or whatever. It's just saying, here is one function. If I give you a three and a three, I want a six back. So that's, all, that's what a unit test does. Um, depending on what you're, uh, what you're writing in, like we're writing in Drupal, you're writing in PHP, you're probably running uh, PHP unit tests. Um, if you're writing JavaScript uh, and you want to run tests on JavaScript, you, you might be using Jest, but there's uh, tons, tons of other JavaScript ones. So our case study, we, we did this project, which was a really fun project where um, we had to take data from an API, uh, and I use that term API loosely, um, from a, uh, a course management system, and we needed to take that data, uh, munge it up, and then stick it into a Drupal site via the JSON API. And so we did this with AWS Lambda functions, step functions, and S3. And in the Lambda functions, we used uh, the Node.js for Lambda functions. And so like you do when you're developing stuff, um, we created a bunch, a, a bunch of libraries of different JavaScript functions and, and classes that we would use um, because these were pretty complex things that we used the step functions in AWS that called a bunch of Lambda functions. They had to go in a particular order. But we, we, we created these, this library of JavaScript um, classes for us to do this. And so we created unit tests for each one of these. Um, every every, every uh, library that we created, all the different functions, we had full test coverage for the whole thing. And it really helped us. We could, we could make a change to our uh, change to the code base, all that's run, and we know it's not going to break anything. And it, it saved us too. Like there was, we were trying to refactor something and we uploaded it and the, the tests ran and this other thing broke that seemed totally unrelated and we never would have caught that before it went into production. But we were able to see, hey, we made a change here and it actually affected this other function over here. And so we had to, we had to fix that. And we were able to catch that before going live. So, um, so that's, uh, that's unit tests. Um, the next is integration tests. I love this. Is that going? So look. <laughs> I love this because a sliding door on its own works great. A slide lock on its own works great. You put them together and it does not work, right? So what this does is make sure uh, that what you did over here um, also works with what you did over here, right? So um, this might be, uh, in Drupal, that might be, you know, you have, uh, uh, you have a module that, that adds a new view type. So, um, a new view display type or something. So you need to make sure it works with views over here, right? So that might be an example of an integration test. Um, they are slower than unit tests, um, but they're faster than end-to-end -end tests. We'll talk about end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end -end tests are sort of the same, except instead of testing two things, it kind of tests your whole, uh, tests your whole uh, project. So on the left here is what all the textbooks say you should have as far as your text test coverage. You should have primarily unit tests. You should have some integration tests. And then at the very tip, you should have a little tiny bit of end-to-end -end just to verify that you know, everything works great when it's all put together into one place. Um, unfortunately, well, in Drupal, 
the right is what you end up seeing. We do a few unit tests, but Drupal is so complex with so many different things, you're probably mostly writing end-to-end -end tests. So end-to-end -end tests run the whole code base all at once, right? This is another great photo, right? It's like we have, uh, we have the bike, and no one just thought you could put a bench there. That's a fine place for a bench, right? Um, so the end-to-end -end test will run the whole project, right? And it'll, you create these tests to test all these features of the entire code base like a user is going through and actually doing the pointy-clicky thing. Um, in Drupal, we're using BHAT because there's great integration um, with, uh, with BHAT using the Drupal extension. Um, if, you're in, uh, uh, if you're in JavaScript, you might be using Cypress. Um, and so I'm going to talk a bit about Cypress. Uh, people have talked about BHAT a lot, so I, f I feel like I don't need to beat that horse. BHAT's awesome um, for, for Drupal and, and for PHP. Cypress is great for, um, for, for JavaScript. And really, it doesn't have to be Java. It's written in JavaScript, so you write your tests in JavaScript. It doesn't have to be JavaScript, but Cypress doesn't have the deep Drupal integration. So like when I say something like, I log in as an authenticated user is one step in BHAT, but Cypress doesn't have anything like that. So if you, if you want to test um, uh, your JavaScript functionality or you want to test uh, more like a static website, Cypress is, is great for that. Um, Cypress has all these cool pieces of functionality. You actually build it within like a, a, like a Chrome browser. Um, you can go back in time. Um, and this is such a key. I don't know if, you, if you've ever written BHAT tests and you have to add things like, and I wait five seconds because this page just isn't ready yet. You move too fast. Or I wait for Ajax to finish. Those are steps in, in BHAT. Cypress, you just don't have to do that. It's going to... It's just going to wait for you. If it doesn't see it yet, it's going to wait. And then it's going to try again. If it doesn't see it, it's going to wait. And then eventually it's going to time out like, OK, after 60 seconds, it's really just not there. And you can set whatever that is. So what we use Cypress for um, is uh, we do a pattern lab for our, uh, for our site farm uh, distribution we have for UC Davis. And so here's, uh, here's the, as it goes through the steps, you can see on the left um, the, each of the steps it goes through and what it's trying to do. And so the nice thing about Pattern Lab, Pattern Lab uh, outputs just static HTML and JavaScript CSS. So it's really quick and fast to go through this, and it actually goes through like you're clicking stuff. So this isn't going to test my Drupal functionality, but it is going to test that the, uh, that the pop-downs or that the, um, the image galleries all function the way uh, the way they're supposed to go. Um, yeah, okay, go through that. Yeah, and, and you can do it right on your local, and then you write the test, and it's stored in, stored in your project. So what I'm going to do here, uh, this is, uh, let's see, is this, okay. Yeah, so we built this pattern lab. And um, so we need to go through and test that all of the JavaScript works the way that we want it to work um, within our pattern lab. Um, so I'm gonna, it's going to be a video of it going through and actually running all this test. It flashes a lot, just a warning if you're, because it actually, you can watch it go, and it just moves really fast. So the screens are going to flash like that. If, that's, if, if you're sensitive to that, I just wanted to give you a warning before it goes. Is it going? There it goes. OK. I get to watch it here. So here, we're going to run it. And it's going to go through. And it's going to pop all the pop downs. And it's going to make sure that the, um, I can't even talk fast enough to tell you what it's doing. So you can see what it's doing. Um, does our hamburger menu work properly? Collapsible things. There's our photo gallery. Search functionality, another photo gallery. And it's done, 25 seconds. Not bad. So we were able to test all of our, um, all of our JavaScript functionality and CSS uh, functionality, if you have some dynamic CSS, um, uh, all within 25 seconds, uh, which is really, really nice. Um, this saved us once when, um, again, we were working on, working on the pattern lab, and we did a new build, and we didn't notice that it didn't pull in a particular library 
um, that we needed. And we didn't have a test for that library because it was just like, well, it just works the way the library works. But we didn't even have a test for like, is the library even there? And so we actually pushed this to production and we got calls the next day and says, how come that, I don't even remember what it was, how come that pop down functionality um, isn't working? I really liked that. Uh, why is that a problem? We didn't even touch that. And so, um, unfortunately, we did end up pushing that to production, but as soon as we figured out what that was, the first thing we did, we wrote a Cypress test for it and make sure that that would never happen again because we don't want that to ever be gone. So that uh, will help us in the future, but you know, you can't, can't write tests for everything. Some things are gonna slip through. You do the best you can, and the first thing you do after you identify a bug is write the, write the test for it so that from then on you know it'll never be a problem again. Um, I'm gonna talk about visual regression tests. So this is, this is the last one here. Um, this tests the differences between two sites. This might be a, pre, uh, a, a, a screenshot um, of a site before and then a screenshot of a site after, maybe if you've made some CSS changes um, or if you've uh, pushed a deployment. Um, it might be a, uh, you know, on, our, uh, on a test server versus what's on a live server. So what this does is it, it, it compares a reference screenshot. So it takes a screenshot of your website, a, a page, and you tell it what pages you want. It takes a screenshot of a page, and then it takes a screenshot of the page either later or, or of a different page that's supposed to look exactly the same. And it does a comparison between the two, and it tells you what percentage of it is different. Visual regression testing is sort of a dark art because it's never gonna be like perfect, perfect, and you gotta figure out kind of what amount of threshold are you okay with it being a little bit different? Because between two days, maybe what your computer ate that morning or whatever, but it might anti-alias things just a little bit different, or that image just might be a pixel off on this side first because of the way that it rendered in the browser. So you need, just need to decide what, um, what, what, what the problem is, um, or, or what, the, what your appropriate threshold is. And so what we use this for is um, kind of a last minute user acceptance testing for our site farm platform. So, um, so here's the example of what it does, where it shows, you know, it, it, it provides this interface where you can uh, see what the difference was. It gives you this kind of cool slider to see, and it highlights the, the, the difference in a, in a bright pink if there's something that's different. So, what we do is on our, they call it again the test server, or let's call it staging server. We've done all the development, we're about to push something to production, we've maybe made some changes to our themes. And so, um, so our sidecar platform has about 500 websites on it. A number of them have decided they want to create some um, customized uh, uh, themes. And so we allow our uh, customers on campus to create generally sub themes because they would use the normal theme, maybe make some CSS changes, maybe add some templates if they've had some content types and stuff like that. So if they've made, if they've made their own sub theme, we want to make sure, and they want to make sure, that if we make changes to our base theme, it's not going to affect their sub theme that they made, um, and it's not going to screw up uh, what, what their site is. Which, you know, if they did it right, it shouldn't, but, you know, we don't know. So what we do is we deploy a handful of sites from live down to our staging server. Um, and then we, we had them, the, the ones that have the sub theme um, you know, are the ones that we bring over there. And they're part of a special group that we tell them when we're about to deploy um, across the entire platform. And we, um, we invite them to come and review uh, not only their site so they can poke around and log in and you know, make sure that the functionality is there or whatever they, you know, and customizations they made, but we also give them the URL of the output um, of this backstop.js, which we deploy to, to S3, um, which is also a cool Bitbuckets pipeline script that does, uh, that uh, takes the screenshots and deploys all that up to S3 as a static web hosting thing. So that's a cool thing too. So they can log in and they can see right away, hey, what has changed? Well, in this case, I don't know if you, you can see what's going on here. It's sort of hard to see with the pain. But in the time between uh, when I deployed the testing or the staging environment and I took the screenshot of the live environment, well, they added a new 
Um, they added a new node. So there's going to be a difference. But this is when you can look at it. This would be considered a failure, but it gives them the opportunity to look at it and say, oh, well, that's not, that's not, that's not a failure. There's nothing wrong with the design or anything. It's just that we've added some new content. Um, but it's a good example of how you can see what the differences are. And it's a good thing for us, we can list a bunch of pages, a handful of pages on every site. And so that's the first thing I go to right after we do our deployment, after I run that, say, is there anything wrong? And then usually it's like, no, zero failures. Everything looks absolutely the same. Awesome. And when there is a failure, it's usually something like that. Um, or it's something we totally intended to do, like maybe we adjusted the way that the footer was or something. And so you'll see it looks like a failure on every site, but it was, it was an intentional thing. So we'll try to explain that to the customers when we send out the emails. You're going to see there are a lot of failures, but this was a change that we made on purpose that the footer is a little higher now. But it gives them the opportunity to see if it really does screw up their site. Um, yeah, so here's the example. Here's the, the two screenshots. Here's what, this is the one that, uh, yeah, there's a slight difference you can see on the lower, the lower right. Yeah. So after we've deployed, so we, the, the steps are we deploy our test environment. So we, we clone a handful of sites. Right now it's about 20 sites from our live environment to the test environment. Um, then we update the test environment with, I say test, I still confuse them. It's called test on the, on the host, but it's like our staging server is what it really is. Um, so we, we de deploy those sites to the staging server. We then update with our newest release of the code, the staging server, and then we take the screenshots between the live environment and the staging environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So let's look at the staging environment. Um, we just talked about it a little bit. Um, what you really want to do with the staging, like so the, the arrows here, there's, there's a lot of arrows going on here. You're going to have to get the code to the staging environment somehow. And you also want to be able to get your... Um, get your, your data from production into, into your staging environment. And I don't have a lot to say about this because I've been using really good tools um, provided by awesome Drupal uh, service uh, providers. So here's an example of uh, what I was just talking about. This is, this is Acquia uh, Site Factory where I select which sites I want to deploy. Um, because like I, like I said, I have 500 sites. I don't need them all on my test server. That's, that would just be overkill, and it would take forever to run anyway. So I just select the ones that I think I, we need to look at, and then hit deploy, and then it'll provision the, the, the test, or I'll call it staging. Um, and it just does it, right? So if, if you have a good hosting service that does this sort of thing, that's super helpful. Uh, this is Pantheon. It does the same thing. Um, in the test environment, there's, you know, there's a couple checkboxes there for... Uh, running update.php for, um, for clearing caches, pulling the files in the database from live, um, hit the button and it just does it. So this really like simulates your rollout, right? All in one, all in one big push. Um, so you know, no longer do you have to go and like download the database and put it in. It's like just push the button and, and make it happen. If you're not using a cool hosting service like Pantheon or, or Acquia, you can certainly script all this stuff yourself um, to, to push if you, if you have your own servers that you're using. Um, you could use CircleCI or you could use something like Jenkins to, to write those scripts to do those things. But that's why we pay companies big bucks because they've already written those, so we don't have to. Um, and deploy to production is sort of a similar thing. Um, you know, we want to be able to push the code to production um, and then we need to run whatever scripts we need to run on production like update.php um, after it's done. Again, here's, uh, here's Acquia where uh, we just, you can select which tag you want um, and then you can decide are we, uh, oh, and you can decide when to do it too. So this is great. I can schedule deployments for like 8 p.m. on whatever night and then it'll just start running and I can bring it up my phone. Yep, it's running. Good. You know. Um, and uh, you, you can decide whether it's just code or if you know you have update.php, it's got to run. Um, it runs faster if you don't have to run update.php because, uh, of course, it does. It's just pushing code at that point. 
um, like a security, you know, a Drupal security release might just have a, a quick change in one function or something, and you just want to push that up to, to production as fast as possible, and uh, that's a good way to do it. You shouldn't have to run up to .php. Um, so this is, like I said, this is Site Factory, and Site Factory lets you do lots of sites, and then it just does them all at once. So it'll update. Um, it does this magic on the back end that I don't fully understand, where it creates a stage. It creates an update server, moves all the sites to the update server, and then updates the code on live, and then it slowly brings them over a few at a time and runs update of PHP a few at a time. So with all of our sites, um, I said we have 500. That's live sites. We actually have closer to 900. 900 total sites, excuse me, on the whole platform. It takes about three, a little over three hours to run the whole thing. But during that time, all the sites are up. For a very brief period, they would get put into maintenance mode, but because of varnish, um, the site appears to be up the whole time. Pretty cool. Pantheon has the same thing. You select the things, do you want to run update.php? You push go, it pushes the, the code to production, it runs update.php on your site, um, clear caches if you want it to clear cache. And again, if you're not using these, uh, these hosting companies, you can write these scripts yourself and use uh, a CI tool like Circle or Jenkins or something in order to, to do these things as well. So, I think we covered it. We covered each of these little pieces um, we covered what they, what they do best, um, and we covered how we can get data kind of between them. And that's that. Do we have any questions? Anything I can go a little deeper in? We have, well, we have as much time as you want. It's the last session of the day. <laughs> yeah. It's great, but it works. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, um, we're, uh, the issue that we have, we just, we just did some updates in Drupal, and we need an operating test suite that can do regression testing against uh, uh, that stack. We want to be able to uh, change this through and be able to move through and do the regressions. I guess that, um, what would be, what would you, for that type of environment, do you have any particular recommendations that we can talk about we have? Um, yeah, so um, for, I would say for a Drupal site, uh, BHAT's the first thing you would want to start with. And so um, you can run the BHAT tests locally on your own local machine. So you don't even really need some special testing environment for it to just get started. Um, but it, what you really want to do, particularly if you're working in a team environment with uh, code reviews and stuff, you do want that to happen on a, like a pull request, right? Where you can do the code review, you can have the automated tests go through, and run your entire BHAT suite. Um, so you don't have to sit there and let it run for however long it's gonna run. Ours runs for about 25 minutes. So if I don't have to sit there and like have my computer doing stuff for 25 minutes, I'd rather have you know these servers do that for me. Um, so I would say starting with BHAT for Drupal is a great place to start. Um, and then uh, do you use, what do you use for your Git repository? Uh, what do you mean? So do you use like GitHub or? Yeah. Yes. Do you use yes. GitHub? Okay. Yes. So GitHub doesn't have, uh, as far as I know, they don't have their own CI tool, but they work with pretty much every CI tool. So look at Circle CI or Travis CI or Provo CI. And um, the way that will work is, like I said, you write this YAML file that's got the script steps. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of examples out there for doing this with Drupal. Um, and then you can, the same command that you run locally that says, you know, run BHAT tests, um, you can have it do that. And then, so after it builds the whole site, it'll go through and run all of your BHAT tests. And because it's running on a nice, efficient Docker container, it will run pretty fast. Um, so I would say that's a good place to start. And so you do that, like, let's say you have a dev branch in your, in your, um, in your GitHub, and then on the pull request from dev to master, you know, you haven't committed to master yet, you're just on dev, but on that pull request, that's where it's gonna run all your tests. And then when you commit to master, 
it'll it'll do the merge, it'll it'll merge that pull request into master, and that's when it'll do your deployment to push that out to, to AWS. So where that happens, you know, I, I don't it, it seems like it would be a lot of tooling to have all that automated testing running on AWS itself, though it certainly could, you know, if you wanted to have it spin up a whole test environment in Elastic Beanstalk, you can have it do that. Um, we're just comfortable using the tools that are available like, like Provo and, and Circle to do that for us. Does that answer your questions? Cool. Good. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so like most of the stuff that you automate testing, you read that before you tell your, um, your team to test, because at, in the GitHub that you showed about your team, like you told them to like, could you check on these certain tests for my new um, push? So is that like after the fact that you have um, run automated tests on your um, new features? Or? Yeah, usually it, it, it sort of depends. Uh, partially it depends on when people have time to look at the pull request. But our workflow is we're developing something locally. We'll write a test for that thing we're developing locally. We'll run the test to make sure that it works, that, that new thing. We generally don't then run the entire suite of tests locally, so that's when we push that up to, uh, to the, the feature branch. And then on the pull request, that's when all the automated tests happen. Generally, I like to wait until the automated tests are done, because if the automated tests fail, like I just wasted my time um, as a reviewer, they just need to go and fix their crap first, right? They did something and it broke something. So until the tests are happy, I don't even bother really looking at it, you know? So that's usually what we do. Sometimes what I'll do is, oh, tests are running, but let's just look through their code anyway and see that, that does it look okay or, you know, did they use the right functions or did they put the update function in the right place or, or whatever. So it might be worthwhile to just start looking at the code, but you would never merge, certainly, before all the tests are, 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 are run. We usually don't even start the code review until, until all the tests are run. Yeah. You know how uh, on our page we have links linked to the external site, and there's another dependent the site, and, and they move their site move, but instead they still keep the old domain, but nothing will happen if you don't run it. And on the old domain, they just say, okay, the site has moved. In this, I mean, for this kind of situation, would the test be able to catch it, or? Um. Yeah, so like a Cypress test could do that because it can follow links and see what's on the other end of the link. But you'd have to write a test for each place you want to click. Because that's like, not a test, but like a line in your test is, and then I click here, right? And then after I or two lines, I click here, I should see this, right? But like if the I should see this is, you know, the title of the page, and then they change the title of the page, the test might fail even though, oh, they just made it edit to their website. So it's, it's, you have to be careful about writing tests based on dependencies that you don't control yeah. because it might fail of no fault of your own and then, okay, well, it failed, so that means I have part of my commit now is I have to go and fix my test so that it looks at the right thing. So, but yeah, things like Cypress and, and even BHAT, they don't care where it's hosted because they're just using a browser. Like they're literally bringing up Chrome and digitally, you know, robotically clicking around. That's the great thing about end-to-end -end tests is that if, if the code doesn't even have to be on the same server that it's running on. Sometimes it's faster if it is. Um, for like BHAT, it, search, it, it sure is. But it doesn't have to be. Um, you can write BHAT tests to go and affect some other server. But if you expect to do things like logging in, um, like with BHAT, you need some sort of integration where it, it, like a Drush integration normally. So if you have Drush integration, you can force things to happen. Without that, I mean, you wouldn't, they wouldn't have any no knowledge of how to log in, for instance, right? Um, so. Yeah, I was thinking using the, the last one that you, the visual, um, the last one that you were talking about, but I think, you know, I wouldn't know when, but it was shot. Right. Um, Yeah, that's tough. So one way to use the backstop is that you commit your reference, the, the main way, the way it's supposed to be used, is you actually commit your references 
your reference screenshots to the Git repository. And when it runs, the screenshots are already taken. And then you can decide, oh, we need to add new screenshots, right? Um, and so the way, it, the, the way it works in the, um, when, you're, when you're actually uh, doing it in the command line is um, you do the test against it, so it's taken all these new screenshots, and then you have to look at them, and then there's going to be failures if things have changed, and then you need to decide, are those failures things that I'm okay with, and now do we need to have you know, new reference screenshots, uh, or are those ones I'm not okay with and I need to go fix my code, right? But once, it's, once you have new screenshots, like, oh yeah, I meant to do that CSS change, this new screenshot is the correct one. Now I'm going to commit that one. You know, I'm going to say accept, I forget the command. I'm going to accept my new screenshots as, as um, the real screenshots now and commit those to the repository. The problem with what you're looking at, though, is that um, they're gonna, their homepage is going to change anyway. They're going to change in small ways. So you want to see if they're changing in big ways. Um, so that's that whole threshold thing. You set the threshold really high. But then they might change. I mean, big ways might be like replacing the entire banner image because that might take up three quarters of the page, right? So, the, but that's not what you're really looking for. So, it's not going to be smart about it really in the same way. Um, but if you know they use the same like template for this page has moved, you can search, and I should not see this page has moved, right? If that's the same all the way around, then you don't have to look for what should be there. Just look for what shouldn't be there. So I would, I, would, I would lean more towards into Anne or Cypress or something. I, I think you'll have a hard time with, the, with visual regression testing to try to figure that out. Um, Anyone else? Yeah. I have one more question. Um, how do you go about like, moving the production database over to the staging, um, especially when you are trying to show like, a new feature for your clients and stuff like that? So, uh, it, it depends on what you're staging and what your production is. So, for instance, if you're using something like Pantheon or Aqua, they just, it's built in, right? You can just do it. Um, if you're not, if, you're, if you control your own staging production environment on AWS or something like that, um, you have to write that script yourself, right? So that means whatever steps you would take to do it, you would export, maybe use Drush if you, if you, if you can use Drush against the production site. You might do a Drush um, SQL dump. You might do a file sync um, from Drush to do that. Um, we use uh, like that, that refresh command that we do with Doxel um, actually uses Terminus, which is a Pantheon command line to, 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 to download the database and then bring it in locally. So like you're writing in the other bash script, how are you, do it manually first and then say, okay, now that I know the steps that need to happen, let's start putting that into a script and then run the script and say, okay, that script seems to run. Now let's put that script into something where I just have a button to run the script, right? And that might be, it might be an API call on AWS API Gateway or something like that, or it might be a Lambda function to do um, the things you need to have done, or it might be, you might have to spin up an EC2 instance because you have to run Drush or run other things in order to make things happen. So it's, it, it, the answer of course is it just really depends on what environment you have and what you can do just using like bash tools or uh, you might write your own Python tools to do it or something like that. But Drush helps a lot if you can use Drush. Thank you. Thank you very much everybody. Hang out. Thank you. Hope you have a good